comics, 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 big comics. I'm Special Agent Joe Getcho. And I'm Special Agent Mike White. And the truth is out there. It is. This is the podcast We Like Comics because they have no bones. And you can find us on social media at Boneless Comics Podcast or on X at Boneless Comics One for all kinds of conspiracy theories and uh, information about alien abductions and things like that. Yeah, we talk about that stuff like totally all the time, especially on social media. I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> uh, but we are a clean comic book podcast where we chat actually about comics from Marvel, DC, IDW, Dark Horse, Image, and more. You can find extra content on BonelessComicsPodcast.com. And you should also look for our after shows and bonus content on our YouTube channel at Boneless Comics Podcast. We don't necessarily have conspiracy theories, but we do have good information on writers and artists and just our thoughts on, you know, comics comics and movies and all kinds of stuff. So you should definitely check those things out. Also, make sure that you don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification bell to get updates. Otherwise, I will have to come and arrest you. That's right. Uh, so today, my artwork for the episode is based on a promotional still that was created for the X-Files during the run of the show. So I actually tried to capture Mulder and Scully's likeness, and then I put a banana-alien hybrid next to them, which won't quite figure into our story today but something kind of related to that does so yeah yeah it definitely looks like it it fits <laughs> looks like it would be a good cover May, maybe for the next yeah. movie they can fight the banana alien hybrid <laughs> banalians banalians the banalians well, on uh, this episode of our podcast, we're going to review The X-Files Season 10, Volume 5, which collects issues 21 through 25, written by Joe Harris with art by Matthew Dow Smith and published by IDW Publishing. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about what The X-Files is, because some people out there may not actually know what The X-Files is. It's not a conspiracy yeah. to keep The X-Files secret, but The X-Files have secrets in them. <laughs> <laughs> so The X-Files is an American science fiction drama TV series that was created by Chris Carter, which originally had nine seasons that aired from 1993 to 2002, and also two feature films that were released in 1998 and 2008. The comic we're discussing today serves as a continuation of the television series because at the time there wasn't one, there was no season 10, but it was later revived for a season 10 in 2016 and also an 11th season in 2018. So it's really confusing because we have comic book season 10 and season 11 and TV season 10 and season 11, which are totally different because they were at different time periods. Yeah, I was going to say something about that earlier when just when I was doing research for the episode, I was like, I have to make sure that I'm getting comic book season 10, not the actual show. Because, yeah, what was it like 2018 or something? The, or, yeah, 2016. Sorry, 2016. Yeah, they actually did bring it back for like six episodes. So there is yep. a legit season 10. Yep. So the, the comic season 10 was very successful, was nominated for two Diamond Gem Awards, 2013 Best New Comic Book Series, and 2013 Licensed Comic of the Year. It was also adapted into a pair of audio drama miniseries, which featured the voice talents of the actors and actresses from the TV show. So David Duchovny, Jillian Anderson, Mitch Pelegi, William B. Davis, all the, the heavy hitters there. So it'd be really cool to go listen to the audio drama after reading the comic series. Oh yeah, that's awesome to actually hear the actors like act out and voice yeah. the lines and stuff. Like, I, I mean, I was doing it in my head, but to hear yeah. it real would be really cool. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so the X Files series revolves around the FBI special agents Fox Mulder and Dana Scully, who investigate cases which have been deemed unsolvable or given minimal priority status by the FBI. Basically, it, the FBI is like these cases are a joke. Get them out of here but they are transferred and then rebranded as X-Files, which constitute unassigned projects outside the Bureau mainstream that are more or less concerned with unexplained phenomena, fringe pseudoscientific theories, and non-credible, I use that term loosely, evidence of paranormal activity and other abnormal events. They're, they visit and talk to people that are psychic, that have been abducted by aliens. They even deal with like the Illuminati in the form of the syndicate, 
Uh, and mm -hmm. the show is really science fiction in nature, but it does actually contain a lot of stories that are based on real life events and leaked case files and things like that. So it's a very fascinating show and it really revolves around uh, Mulder and Scully, the dynamic duo who investigate all these various different cases. It's a really cool show. If you haven't watched it, it is in HD now. Go watch it. It's it's awesome. Yeah, um, pretty, pretty incredible that they went back and did that. I really would prefer that they do that with all 90s sci-fi um babylon 5 has gotten that that treatment as well and it's really neat so yeah, yeah it, it's definitely one of those things that makes it feel less dated when you can see it in a little bit more detail although maybe i don't know some of the alien costumes and stuff probably don't hold up as well under that much so far so other. good I, we're re-watching and like in i think season three now and uh oh, okay everything looks pretty like i don't see anything that looks like super fake but i think because everything was pretty well practical it it translates right. well to hd whereas a lot of the you know older cgi at the time when that gets turned into hd it looks even worse than it did before yeah yeah that's true well speaking of Mulder and scully our characters today are Fox Mulder, who is a highly skilled but very unconventional FBI agent that specializes in the paranormal. And so he's kind of driven by the abduction of his sister when uh, he was a child, and Mulder became obsessed with the unexplained and conspiracy theories, especially those to do with alien abductions. So Fox's far-fetched theories often make him a laughing stock amongst the other agents, and so they call him Spooky Mulder as a result, because, you know, he's always looking into all that creepy stuff that none of them take seriously. So uh, he's basically the believer in, on the show, whereas Dana Scully is more of a cynic and a skeptic, which is kind of what makes the show work in a lot of ways because of their mm -hmm. parallel, or their, not their parallel, but their almost antagonistic viewpoints, you know, working together to get to the truth. So uh, we also have Dana Scully. She is a medical doctor. And also a special agent with the FBI that was originally assigned to, to the FBI to be Mulder's partner, specifically to debunk his work. So right from the get-go, it's like she's there and she's not somebody that he would really want to be there because it's her job to make him look like an idiot, basically. <laughs> so, But despite her background in hard science and cynicism, she's nonetheless a lapsed Catholic. So that's kind of an interesting aspect of her backstory where like she is really into the science and and you know all all of the like we've got to get the facts and and it's mm -hmm. not going to be anything sensational but she also is a person of faith as well which really only gets brought up if there's an episode that they want to like revolve around that but you know it it is part of her character so uh but she and Mulder eventually develop a deep trust of each other despite their differences so they they end up working together really well which given there have been 11 seasons of the show now you would hope that any antagonism would kind of you know wipe itself out there otherwise why are they still working together so, uh, <laughs> yeah i mean there you go the so the cigarette smoking man is the primary antagonist for the x-files series he does actually have a civilian name, but it's not really important. Like we basically Carl refer something. to him as the smoking. <laughs> yeah, it's Carl something. Uh, we basically refer to him as the smoking man. That's how he's known uh, throughout the series. He's a powerful operative with connection to both the FBI and the Pentagon. And throughout the series, he's often seen like quietly thwarting Mulder and Scully's efforts to find the truth from behind the scenes. He works with the syndicate to hide certain truths from the American public like the existence of the colonizers, which are kind of like the main alien race that we see on the X-Files. And later on, we find out that he actually is Agent Mulder's biological father, although Mulder was raised by a fellow syndicate member, Bill Mulder. So he's technically, Mulder's technically not his real last name. He was adopted by that other guy, but mm -hmm. that's, that's only kind of like tangentially related to this story, yeah. so... 
So what's not really related, but I thought was a really cool uh, mm -hmm. bit of information is that the character of the smoking man was actually written as an extra for the pilot episode. And he only says like four audible wor words in the entire first season of the show. So the actor was like, hey, I got wow. this job and, you know, I was just supposed to be an extra. And then, you know, I'd get a line here and a line there. And eventually, you know, he got more lines and became more integral to the story. But also before joining the X-Files, he had not smoked a cigarette in 20 years and he didn't oh think the show was going to last. <laughs> so for the first two episodes he was in, he smoked real cigarettes thinking, ah, you know, whatever, I can just go ahead and do yeah. it. But then later he changed to like herbal cigarettes. So that way, you know, he could continue on the show and not jeopardize his health. So <laughs> oh kind of interesting God. tidbits there. Well, it's amazing with stuff like that, because you're an extra. If you don't have lines, they don't have to pay you. Uh, like an actor rate mm -hmm. um so once he started to get lines it's like oh now you're actually making money at this whereas before that never occurred to me he could stand around ominously in the background and if he doesn't say anything they don't have to pay him really yeah. the the actor rate for the show so that's really awesome for him that it <laughs> you know turned into like a big role uh so really the main antagonist for our story today is Gibson Praise. And Gibson Praise was a chess prodigy first met by Mulder and Scully in 1998 in the season five finale, The End. While the syndicate set out to kill Praise at a young age, Praise displayed telepathic abilities and instead forced the assassins to kill themselves. So months later, Mulder and Scully found him hiding in their car and his skull had been cut open and stitched back shut. So those were kind of signs that like the syndicate scientists had conducted experiments on him mm -hmm. or investigations on his brain, because of course they're like, wow, he can read minds. Like we want to recreate this. Yeah. So uh, Mulder and Scully took him to the hospital where he was soon kidnapped again by an opera of the cigarette smoking man or the CFM. Uh, his final appearance was actually in the series finale where we find out that Mulder spent a year living with praise in Arizona after he left Washington, DC while on the run from super soldiers and the new syndicate. Mm -hmm. So Praise returned to testify on Mulder's behalf when Mulder was on trial for his life. And after Mulder and Scully leave to make their final escape, agents Doggett and Monica Reyes vowed that they would try to keep Praise safe. So that's kind of where we left off with that character after the show in. Yep. And then our last character that we have um, is not as important, but she's kind of been folded into Mulder's backstory as well just for the comic. Her name is Carolyn Ross, and she's a woman that Mulder interviewed in the past about alien abductions, but she hung herself when Mulder didn't take her seriously because she was like a drug addict and had a history of mental health issues, and he's like, oh, you're wasting my time. But in this story, she's inexplicably reappeared and seems to kind of vacillate between wanting to hurt Mulder, like at gunpoint, or help him by giving him more information. So... That's part of our mystery, and those are the characters that you need to know about for the story today. All right. So our story arc that we're going to be talking about is called Elders, and it consists of five parts which make up the season finale, if you will, to the X-Files season 10 comic. So remember, this is the comic book season 10 that takes place after the TV show season 9 ended, not the actual season 10 of the TV show, which came years later. So a little confusing there. Mm -hmm. But also, this is kind of a, a weird and interesting comic to try to summarize, because not only does it take place nine years after nine years of TV lore and 20 issues of comics, but the story is also about uncovering the truth. So giving a story synopsis is basically just like, here's the truth of the story. It kind of takes away from the suspense and the magic of actually going through the story and, you know, trying to guess at, at what's happening. So it might sound a little bit boring because it's not containing any of that suspense. It's more just like, well, here's what happens. So just keep that in mind. Sure. But essentially at the beginning, we find that Mulder's been set up. He's made some questionable choices over the years. And some of the ones at the beginning of his career are being dredged up to discredit him. And he's being accused of leaking government secrets to the press, which kind of brings up an interesting point. Like, why hasn't he leaked government secrets to the press in, you know, 10 years? <laughs> like, it seems like everybody's leaking stuff to him as a government person, but then he's keeping it under wraps. So, I mean, he's just as guilty. But anyway, that's another, that's a discussion yeah, point for later, is. maybe. <laughs> um, but basically he goes on the run. He's confronted by a now grown up, Gibson praise because he was a, a child, you know, 
-hmm. years ago in season five when he uh, showed up on the TV show, but his abilities have continued to develop. He was introduced in the comics in issue four, or reintroduced into the series, I should say, into the comics in issue 14. So he's been in the last several issues of uh, the comic and has since resurrected the cigarette smoking man who is presumed dead and the entirety of the original conspiracy group known as the Syndicate. So unlike in the past where the syndicate operated in secrecy and manipulation for their own benefit, Gibson believes the only way to prevent the worst case scenario of human extinction is to take control of the conspiracy himself and use the original syndicate members as tools to reshape the world according to his vision. So he has kind of the same goal. He wants to, you know, to be involved in this, you know, alien colonization project, but he wants to run it his way and he's going to do it by hiding in plain sight at least until the resurrected cigarette smoking man has his own agenda, who's secretly working to undermine Gibson by feeding information to Mulder. So Gibson is very smart. He's very powerful. He's got uh, these special psychic abilities, but he gets distracted by his own ego and overconfidence. So he lets his guard down long enough for Scully to gun him down in the end, except his body melts away because he was a clone and suddenly there are multiples of him all around. Mulder sticks around to investigate further while Scully heads back to the FBI to try to clear Mulder's name. And it's implied the FBI is a slave to corporate interests. So they're going to be outsourcing the X-Files division. And that's really where our story ends, which basically sets up the start of season 11. So that's pretty much it. Yeah. One thing I wanted to note, um, I wasn't sure I was kind of holding it back earlier about Carolyn Ross is that she was in fact a clone. And this story is absolutely filled with clones. And so Life it's a decoys. big story point that they're, yeah, that they're like 93% of the original, mm -hmm. which is how they can tell when they do a DNS t DNA test later, like, oh, this isn't actually this person. There's something a little bit off about their genetics, even though they're like really close. And also in this story, cloning somebody also allows you to transfer their memories because... Mm. Cigarette smoking man knows everything that like he did when he was alive before. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's take a short break and then we'll be right back to discuss. I'm an annoyance to my superiors, a joke to my peers. They call me spooky. Spooky Mulder. I'm the key figure in an ongoing government charade. The plot to conceal the truth about the existence of extraterrestrials. These men have been secretly negotiating a planned Armageddon. And you have conclusive evidence of this? Yes. It's a global conspiracy with key players, the highest levels of power. It reaches into the lives of every man, woman, and child on this planet. You've seen more than you should. Trust no one, Mr. Mulder. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, so I guess let's just get right into it. Did the tone, balancing, action, and humor feel consistent with the X-Files show? And I'm going to put this to you first because you're a lot more familiar with the X-Files show than I am. I think I only ever made it to season three. So there mm -hmm. you go. And I like remember the movie. I watched the movie. The, the first movie or the second movie? Yeah, the first, the first movie. Fight the Future or whatever. Yeah, I so I remember catching bits and pieces of the X-Files and then... I uh, mm. actually rewatched it maybe 10 years ago or so, or, or picked up and watched the parts that I had missed, like all the way through season nine. And then we just started going back through it a um, little while ago. And I think we're in like season three, so not, not too far back oh, nice. into it, but, but I, I really felt like this matched the, the consistency, like with the show, like the way the witty kind of humor, it's not quite Joss Whedon level, mm -hmm. but it's like just a little bit of you know, humor in there and kind of like lightening up a little bit and Mulder and just like how he, he can be in a serious situation and say something mm -hmm, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, to loosen things up. So I, I thought it was pretty consistent. I, it, it's, it's, this is a hard question for me because my impression of the X-Files, again, just having watched maybe three and a half seasons and then I saw Fight the Future is that it doesn't have one tone. It, they have episodes where it's really dark and horror and serious and, you know, you know, or something really disgusting will happen in that episode. And then we have series, uh, we have like episodes of the series that are like completely goofy 
where like Mulder's getting high on mushrooms or something and you see his <laughs> bad trip or, or something like that. I mean, and there's there's one I know in the, the actual TV season 10 where there's like an alien that that came to Earth and he was just like living in this motel trying to learn about humans. And so he he's like, and I got addicted to drugs and I did all these things. And he, he's like, because I'm doing the real human experience. And so it feels like they do kind of bounce back and forth between that like really serious tone where like it's just an FBI procedural where mm -hmm. which again that's a lot of what people are missing with your um your synopsis as far as reading it because reading it you're really seeing them go through all the FBI procedures and yeah and doing the investigating and trying to figure things out and while it may be like a simple narrative as far as like what happens the getting to what actually happened was quite a process and so that part of it felt really like yeah this is the show because that's honestly what they spend a lot of their time doing on the show is just like investigating and hey this thing's weird like what do you think happened here and then older will see something absolutely astonishing and scully will miss it by like 30 seconds and be <laughs> like don't you think it was actually swamp gas rising off of the lake or something and that wasn't really mm -hmm. an alien. I'm going to take a more credible whatever. source and whatever. Like, no, right. Scully, I exactly. saw it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, so yeah, there, there was some humor in the show that came from that, too. Where it was like, it was humor, but it was also, like, disappointing. Where you're like, I wish she would just see something amazing <laughs> so that she would believe in. Because, you know, us as the audience, we always see it. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I, I felt like tonally this was right in that, that pocket, you know, where yeah. it should have been. And so. I think it helps that like the the art was very like it, it looked like them, but not mm -hmm. to the point again. And we've talked about this, I think, in, in several episodes this of season of our podcast of yeah. like having artists that draw exact carbon copies of actors and actresses to the point where they're actually taking a screen grab and, you know, copying yeah. that versus something that's just like. Sure, it sort of loosely looks like the the character from the show, but it's so different or they have some poses that are weird. And I felt like this was kind of maybe more to that that side of things where like people were recognizable. They looked like the characters that they were supposed to. But then there was the the art was like what it wasn't very sharp and specific in a lot of details. Like there's one yeah, of yeah. Scully super far away where she's like looking over her shoulder. And I swear it looked like somebody just kind of drew like a dot for an eye, a little bit of a nose, and then like a smile squiggle. And that was it for her facial features. So I, I think it helped it because it looked sort of like the show. And that sort of made you, you know, keep the tone because a lot of the colors were that way too. But I have a feeling you have a lot to say on the way that mm -hmm. the art was actually uh, drawn. So, so the art, the, the art does something, but I think Matthew Dow Smith was a good choice for the story because what he's doing with the art is really, really heavy into blacks. It's not so much like shadow as it is just like a hard black um, to indicate shadow. So you're not seeing like gradual levels of, of stuff fading into the darkness. It's like there's black and then there's the stuff that's in light enough for you to see it. And that reminds me a lot of the look of the, look of the show, honestly, mm. because on the show, um, actually for budgetary reasons, they used a lot of darkness and blackness to hide things that would, you know, make the creature look a little bit more convincing in the episode or, you know, whatever, whatever the thing was. But everything was shot very, very dark on the X-Files um, is my memory of it. What, especially because when it started the other big sci-fi show that was on TV was Star Trek The Next Generation where all the lights are on all the time <laughs> yeah. and it's like super bright. So the, but no the lens contrast flares. between... Right, exactly, there were no lens <laughs> flares. But yeah, the contrast between those two um, those two shows at the time on TV was like really big. So I think that he was able to really capture kind of the essence of the visuals of the show in how there was a lot of stuff kind of semi-obscured and actually in the after show, I've done more of an analysis of just his his art style. But as far as how it relates to the story itself, um, I, I feel like he definitely uh, he definitely nailed the, the essence of the show, you know, yeah. and. Um, I don't know, it's it definitely reminds me of guys like uh, not necessarily Frank Miller, because Frank Miller will do a lot of detail in his work, but Mike Mignola, who does Hellboy does a lot with the color black and then just 
but he kind of defines his figures more by having really unusual silhouettes. So Hellboy's silhouette, you're not ever going to dismiss that for anything else. It's he has a very like unique shape to him, and mm-hmm. Abe Sapien does, and all those characters. This wasn't so much that way because we're grounded a little bit more in reality in this story, but sure. it was enough kind of in that style that it felt like the show and it also worked for comic books. So I didn't really have any complaints about it. There wasn't there wasn't anything, again, like the Knuckles panel that we brought up earlier in the year where <laughs> um, somebody's face just looked like super goofy yeah. or you know, I, I think like too, it was kind of like a, like a, a thing to do in writing is you state something like, like an acronym. Mm-hmm. Okay. What does this acronym mean? And then later when you're talking about it, you can use the abbreviated version because we all know what you're talking about. I kind of felt sure. like I saw some of that in, in the art because you would see the person with a lot of detail on their face, like the cigarette smoking man. He's got all those wrinkles and the way his chin kind of like narrows yeah. and he's got that scowl look. And then you see him do other mm-hmm. things where his you you kind of just see like the silhouette of his hair or kind of the shape of his body or something and and i wonder like your mind kind of fills in like well i know who that is because i just saw that person and so then you don't have to draw yeah. as many details after the close up yeah it i mean maybe it was a way to save time um but it didn't come across that way too bad yeah. to me so i yeah i really didn't mind it it was very stylized but i felt like this was a good fit for this property Whereas um, Smith has done a lot of work for Doctor Who as well. Mm. And I actually feel like that would not necessarily work quite as well. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah. That show to me, at least most of the time, is a little bit brighter. Unless, you know, they have a Weeping Angels episode or something <laughs> like that, obviously. So um, there, there was one thing. We, we talked briefly about how it's, it's like a crime procedural Kind of thing where they're looking at clues and they're trying to figure out what what's going on one of the things that i love 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 about the x-files is that it does not do the story trope that happens a lot in uh like japanese rpgs and anime and other things where you have a character that's withholding information just to make the plot more mysterious mm-hmm. but there's like not a good character motivation reason for them to be withholding information so there's a lot of things in like some of the Tales of games or even Final Fantasy games where it's like, if this character just told everybody what was going on earlier, we could have avoided a whole bunch of problems. But instead they're like, I think I'll keep it to myself and there's no like real reason for it. In this story, it's like, well, Gibson is not going to tip his hand because, you know, he doesn't necessarily want everybody to know that he's mind controlling them or making clones or all this stuff. And I felt like all the information that was being compartmentalized by like the cigarette smoking man and stuff too, like it made sense for that character not to be forthcoming. And it wasn't just a story device. So Mm -hmm. I was actually really happy that it was written that way. Yeah. And and a lot of times, like everybody has a little bit of information. So Mm -hmm. you kind of have to talk to everybody to get the full story kind of at the end. But yeah, like a a lot of the people who say, well, I know what's going on, but because I'm involved with it, because I helped, because I have some other agenda, I'm not going to tell you that information. But what I am going to tell you is this, because this is what I need you to work on and you to do to fit my, you know, it's like everybody's got their own, like, what they're trying to do and manipulate everybody else. So it makes sense that everybody's keeping mm-hmm. secrets. Whereas like with Dumbledore, it's like, just tell the kid what's going on. Like he would have been so much more prepared <laughs> instead of making him guess and be in the dark. That's a good point. That's one of the best examples I think is of Dumbledore just being like, well, I, I felt bad for the boy. So I didn't tell him the information he needed to survive. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, thank you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're more familiar with the show than I am, but did you feel like they ticked enough boxes or kind of linked it up to the continuity of it enough for it to be satisfying for somebody that's like a hardcore fan? Because I'm probably, I would consider myself a fan, but I'm like a casual fan mm-hmm. of X-Files as opposed to you where I feel like you've seen all of it and, you know, you're more familiar. 
I mean, the, the the thing is, like, there there's so much of it. Like, even with just the nine yeah. seasons, I mean, there there are episodic stories where it's pretty much just this story in a vacuum, and then there's like the overarching mm. longer plot that you get not just over a season, but over multiple seasons, where it twists and turns and becomes even more convoluted. And what's a lie and what's the truth? And th- it's just it's a lot to really you know process and and mm. keep together to have like what you know what's the main overarching story of the X Files. Like you could kind of mm-hmm. sum it up, but there's so many different, you know, different areas and avenues and things going on. So I, I feel like it's one of those things that if you're going to reference it, you're going to have 10 references and people are going to get a couple of references here and there, depending on which episodes were memorable to them. Yeah. But yeah. only you're like really diehard. Like I've seen every episode multiple times person is going to get every single one and how they link together. Like with um, Gibson Pry- Praise, I had to kind of go back to, okay, what episodes was he in? Oh, that's right. He was the kid in that chess Mm -hmm. game where there was like an assassin and all this other stuff. But like, I didn't remember his name. So when I saw him in the comic, I was just like, oh, okay. It seems like he's, have we seen him before? And then when I went to go look up his name, oh yeah, that was the kid in that episode. Oh, he was in the series finale. Okay. And then like, it all starts to, you know, make a little more sense there. So I, I think there was a lot of just kind of, uh, references or or things like like you have listed in the notes like Mulder mentioning his sister things that like are integral to the characters that you kind of just expect to be referenced but I I don't yeah. necessarily put you know like oh there's a poster of Stan Lee on a bus for us to get like a subtle reference like I don't feel like they did subtle references like that I think no. it was kind of just like this is a continuation of the show these are things that are important that we assume that you know but it wasn't like hiding little tiny do remember the third episode of this season where we saw this for two seconds well it's in the comic like they they didn't go that far as far as i could tell well i mean gibson himself it seems there's a little bit of like a deep cut of a character to pull out but i guess he was in the finale which you mentioned Mm -hmm. um earlier which i i did not when you added that to my notes i mentioned it but but I was reading what you wrote. Um, I didn't realize that he was in even more than one episode. I thought it was just like a one-off thing. They saw him playing chess and, you know, maybe they found that his head had been cut open later, but, but I didn't realize that he was, you know, in, had a multiple episode arc. So that alone kind of made me go, oh, cool. So they're, they're really playing with mythology that's already been set up by the show. And mm-hmm. I think that's what you want for something like this. I mean, we talked about it with Buffy and with Darkwing Duck and, even to a smaller degree like Sonic the Hedgehog, but when you're making a media adaptation comic, um, you really do want to pull in those people that are familiar with it. That should be your primary audience. But I still felt like it was accessible enough because they gave you flashbacks of Gibson playing chess at one point. And he said something about like, oh, I, they sent people after me to kill me, but I took them out, you know, before, before they could do anything basically. And so, so all of that was kind of um, in the comic book itself so that you can mm-hmm. follow it if you didn't know already. Yeah. And the the Illuminati or the Syndicate, I remember like brief glimpses of episodes where it was just like a room full of shadowy men that were all talking mm-hmm. about stuff. And, you know, the cancer man, or I mean, the smoking man would like come in there and be like smoking and watching and. I was never clear, like, is he their leader? Is he just there observing? Like, what's he doing? But I think I got as far as finding out that he did JFK assassination. And then that's yeah. about where I ended the, the <laughs> series. So because they did that episode where they kind of go into his backstory and they show, you know, a lot of what he's been up to. And some of it's mm. pretty, pretty messed up. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, so they they're all basically they they are in like different avenues of business and they all have you know, oh, agendas to keep the truth hidden so that they can continue on doing the stuff that they're doing behind closed doors. But it's it's always been weird to me how they kind of use Mulder to expose things to be able to keep secrets. 
but sometimes it's like they yeah. they don't know information and so sometimes they're trying to figure out okay we heard that there is something going on but we don't know what's going on we need somebody to get in there get the information and then that way we can take over and so they use Mulder for that a little a lot where they give him a little bit of information and they say mm -hmm. hey go figure out what's happening and so he goes to figure out what's happening he figures it out and then the lights turn off and everybody's gone or he goes back to the building and it's completely evacuated yeah. and you see the syndicate going hey we just got our hands on some really great stuff you know thanks to that Mulder guy going in and poking his nose around and and Mulder's like oh we got set up again and there's a lot of that that happens too <laughs> yeah I do remember some of that it it feels like they're they are it, it's one of those where like they'll give him a little bit of the truth a little mm. bit of information just to sort of keep him going but it's never going to be all of it. It's never going to be everything. And so that way they can kind of keep manipulating him. And, um, you know, I mean, there were, there were times during the series that I can remember that they were getting too close to stuff. And so the syndicate would actually shut down the X-Files at the FBI and be like, well, we're closing that entirely. And so then they would, have to, they would have to fight to, like, get reopened or Mulder and Scully would even have to go rogue and just be investigating yeah. stuff on their own. I think around some of the early seasons, they already were kind of experimenting with stuff like that. So, well, that's um, the thing. It's like yeah, there's not I mean, there's not one person who is this is the evil person with this right. person's evil agenda. It's like a group of shadowy figures that are all mm -hmm. trying to they'll betray each other even. And so a lot yes. of times it's like, well, one person's trying to shut down the X-Files, but another person is helping to get the X-Files back because it's a, a means to an end that can help them get more information. So there's a lot of like push and pull as these different powers that are behind the shadows start to, you know, make certain things happen. And there's no consistency because while they do meet as a group, they kind of all, you know, are going to do what they want to do anyway and feed information whoever they want to to get what they want. But the thing with uh, Gibson praises, he steps in and he's like, we're not going to do business that way anymore. I'm going to be in control of the syndicate. I'm right. going to be the figurehead and I'm going to put all of this stuff out in plain sight because that's the best place to hide things. But we don't really get to see what exactly that means as far as what he's going to do because we spend a lot of time with the the like clones and trying to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Then by the time we get to the end where we should have gotten some kind of villainous monologue about, okay, here's my entirely mm -hmm. dastardly plan, Scully shoots him. <laughs> yeah. In the head. And yeah. it's it's pretty graphic. Um I I was going to say this is this is something we could push to later to talk about now, but the the thing about having everything out in the open felt like very much a modern thing where they were like, Well, the internet is out there and like it's really prevalent and information is super accessible now. And this is very much like the post nine eleven era politics. So they bring up like Guantanamo Bay at one point, which of course the public knew at the time the US government is capturing and torturing people there. That's what they're doing. It was it was in the news. It was, you know, stuff that we knew that was going on. But then this is something the X Files the X Files does a lot is they'll take something that happened in history and then they'll be like, but also this other thing was going on that you didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And the sensational thing in the news that you were looking at was distracting you from the fact that Gibson was actually running his cloning camp at Guantanamo as well. And so it felt like that was kind of a good way to, his hiding in plain sight thing felt like a way to kind of push it into the 2000s, where like now we're in the information age. And so because people can get access to any information, instead of like burying it deep and making it really secretive and making people suspicious, we're going to keep it kind of close to the surface, but we have a crazier story on top of it that people are like more outraged about. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of felt like as far as I, I know you would put later, like, is this a perfect fit for the nineties or can it function now? That felt like a good way to kind of modernize it where it's like, we'll just take historical events that happened in the two thousands or the 2010s or something. And then yeah. write your conspiracy stuff around that. I think you can kind of make it work for any, time period because of that because it's it's so easy to look at history and just be like well yeah here's all these horrible things that that were happening what was happening where we weren't looking you know and that's that's kind of what gibbs doing 
So. Right. Or what was happening behind the scenes of the thing that was bad. Exactly. Something even worse that exactly. you didn't even know about. Well, I, I think exactly. that's, that's always like the hard thing is how do you balance? Okay. So this show and this series is all built on keeping secrets and information sure. is not available. But now, like you said, in the information age, like not only is that information mm -hmm. available, but it's like almost like information overload. And there's just as much inaccurate, incorrect, or mistaken information as there is correct information. And so then we have fact checkers, right. but then what are they checking that against? And what is that based on? And now we have AI where, where does it get in its information from? And right. is it going to side with the majority public opinion and ignore things like in the X-Files where you have just a couple people who are saying, no, I saw this happen instead. Well, you know, now we're going to you know, like all the information is like, how do you right. sift through that to decide what's true and what's not? And I, I think that this just like barely dips its toe into that by sort of bringing us into what uh, praise is going to do, but we we don't actually get there. And you know, right. again, this is a storyline that's been building kind of throughout this season of the comic book. Mm -hmm. And then we're looking at the last couple issues. So it'd be interesting to see if season 11 delivered based on, you know, everything that we see here at the end of season 10 to that's where you would get the yeah. payoff of, okay, what, how are we bringing the X-Files into, you know, modern history as of mm -hmm. 2013? And how, how does that change the characters? How does that change the dynamic and how the stories actually go? Because they can probably do a lot of their research that they normally did just by sitting on the computer all day yeah. and getting access to information and just, you know, go Google stuff. Most people are going to have a blog about their, you know, crazy experience now. So you don't even need to go interview them. It's all there. Right. But again, it's almost like information overload where there's just so much to sift through, through that's like, well, who's right and who's wrong and who's confused and who's on drugs. And you don't really know yeah. <laughs> looking at all well, this I information. Mean a good example of that in, in the real world is like during the height of 2020, when the pandemic was really bad, the government was closing down all these businesses and all this stuff. The government issued an official state that year saying a lot of those uh, UFOs that we told you were actually these other things. We actually don't know what they are. And we lied about it. The government <laughs> came out and said that publicly. But there was so much other stuff going on that it just went away immediately in the news cycle because people were like, we don't care if aliens are real right now because we have a global pandemic and there are killer hornets in the Northwest and there's, you know, rioting going on and all mm -hmm. this stuff. But it's it's that same thing of like, can you trust that information? Like, you don't know. So it felt like how Gibson was kind of hiding in plain sight, like that actually was very feasible. And that's kind of how things are done today. So right. it was, I mean, in a way, it's kind of scary how like realistic his his methodology was. I mean, not the cloning and all that stuff, obviously, because <laughs> he's he is making alien human hybrids, which for some reason is what everybody wants to do on the X-Files. Mm -hmm. That seems like a really big. Well, like, that's why. Like, yes, let's combine alien and human DNA. That's why Praise has the abilities that he does is because he is an alien right. human hybrid and he's stable and mm -hmm. he's functional, you know, being the villain in this story. But he he has these extra normal abilities that come with having that alien DNA. So that's why they want it is they want to take right. like, oh, if they live longer, oh, they have telepathic abilities, blah, blah, blah. You could genetically right. engineer that into the human race. And look, now we have all these great people who have all this ESP and all this other stuff. And now we need Psychops to rule them all. And Bester is there. No, wait, no, yep. <laughs> going into a different sci-fi there, but... But, yeah, but does the X Files feel like how we get to the Babylon Five future in a way? <laughs> because that's where telepaths come from. Does I mean, just like EarthGov is a really corrupt organization yeah. on Babylon Five, so it almost feels like the way things are heading on the X Files is like, oh yeah, that's how we get to that future. Okay, <laughs> like, <laughs> well, one thing, one thing I noticed about Praise, and, and maybe this is just because I've read too many comic books, but. His motivation, basically, once they get down to it, is it's almost like he admires Mulder for seeking out the truth and exposing it and doing all these things. And he, But he's like, I can do it better. And mm -hmm. I can manipulate it even better because I have these abilities. So what it reminded me of was, um, but he's also kind of like making Mulder's life miserable at the same time because he yeah. like kidnaps him and, you know, shows him a clone of his father and does all this stuff. 
And what it reminded me of was Eobard Thawne being such a huge fan of the Flash that he's like, I'm going to give you more trauma and make you better at your job. Mm. Like, that kind of felt like that was also Praise's motivation, where he was like, well, I, I really admire Mulder so much. Let me make him miserable and, and we'll, <laughs> you know, do all this stuff together and it'll be Let me great. give him something Mulder's to like, investigate. Yeah, and Mulder's like, you're crazy and I don't think I want to help you. Like, that's <laughs> not But... But yeah, it just, I don't know, that parallel kind of stuck out to me a little bit, so. Yeah, I, I think the other thing too is like, and there there's, you know, symbolism and parallels all, all over the place, but I was reading some sure. things about like, you know, Mulder and Scully, they were in their, what, 20s in the 1990s. So the idea here right. now is that they're 20 years now older. And so not only mm -hmm. are they... Um, they're from the older generation, but now you've got Price, who was a kid when all this was going on, who is now an adult. And so it's like you have sort of the the not only the modern of modern age of like technology and the Internet, but now you have this kid who's now an adult who's like, I have a different perspective on, you know, all of this stuff than you guys are going to have because, you know, he's younger and has had different right. experiences. So there, there's that sort of thing, too, of like almost looking at Mulder as like, like a father figure saying, Hey, mm -hmm. you know, I've grown up now. And so I'm seeking validation and look what I can do. Look what I've done. I, oh, isn't that great. <laughs> I just wanted to make you proud. You know, I think he actually says that in the story. Like I wanted to make you proud yeah. or make you happy or something. So there's kind of that going on as well, where he's like trying to impress Mulder. Like, I just want you to say you're proud of me. Like a, a kid would to his father. Yeah. But, you know, seeing a room full of, alien human hybrid clones is probably not what Mulder was was well, most looking for in his life uh, yeah so. and that's why that's not a good idea is because there are often side effects with the alien DNA like demented thoughts and uh, yes. weird crazy villainous <clears throat> schemes to take over the world <laughs> yeah so it it was interesting um I originally thought that there was an issue with the colorist early in the story hmm. because when we see um let me go I can't remember her name oh Carolyn Ross who had supposedly had this previous relationship with Mulder and all that, and she holds him up at gunpoint, she gets shot, and there's, like, green splashing out of the back of her neck. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, the colorist kind of screwed up there. <laughs> but then later on, there's other people bleeding green, and we find out, oh, no, they're actually all, you know, clones that have, it's, I guess it's, like, 7% alien DNA in them, and yeah. then they're 93% the person or unidentifiable. That from. Yeah, so... Yeah, they don't actually confirm that it's alien, but I just assumed that, I guess. But yeah, so so all the blood being green actually was because well, they're not technically human. So, so there's it one makes sense later. I just there's one panel where there's like a sheriff and I think the deputy, and so the mm -hmm. sheriff bleeds green, but he shoots the deputy who doesn't. We don't see any blood at all. So it's like. Right. He probably was human, but they didn't show the red blood. They censored that, but they're able to show green, kind of like with yeah. Star Trek Six, where they can show pink blood and it's okay. But it's okay to show Gibson Fraze's head exploding. That's fine. And that was red. <laughs> that, yeah, that's true. Oh, that was very know. red. It, it was very red. Um, it kind of made a, me this, think about... This really isn't as uh, violent as some of the other stuff we've read, though. Yeah. I mean, it's very... It's like, here's kind of an isolated incident of violence, but it's not, it's not pervasive. It's not like Berserker or anything like that. Berserker! It kind of made me think of um, the Purple Man, uh, the David Tennant version from uh, yeah. Jessica Jones, where he's like mind controlling people. And so the only way to shut him down is to, well, squish his head, but... Uh, basically the, the same kind of result yeah. where it's like make your head explode in order to stop all this stuff going on because mm -hmm. he actually I think he controls the deputy in that scene and makes him attack the sheriff so that the sheriff can shoot yeah. him and he takes out the sheriff who then bleeds green and there are all these like weird occurrences of, of things happening yeah, so yeah. I was getting that's, like little purple man vibes happened. there too that's definitely what happened there'd be you, you could be this was the only thing confusing about the story until they finally let you, the reader, in on what's going on, is that you do have mm. scenes where you've got characters talking to each other, and then suddenly the character will switch because they've been, all of a sudden, they were mind-controlled by praise, and yeah. now, you know, they're going to act contrary to how they were before. So the sheriff, 
at first was like threatening praise, but then he like turns around and points the gun at the deputy or whatever. And I was just like, what's going on? Like, I don't understand. But of course, as you keep reading it, you know, it starts to make sense. So, yeah. and, and to their credit, they did have the letter change the dialogue bubble, like how their text looks when they're being mind controlled. So that was a good touch to kind of clue you in a little bit to what's going on. Mm-hmm. So, so an aspect of the show that I was just starting to get pieces of when I got to X-Files Fight the Future, and actually it was, it was part of how they sold the movie, was they were like, will Mulder and Scully get together? And I guess everybody in the 90s was like, oh, we're, we're shipping them and we want to see them be together ro- romantically. Um, how do you feel about them actually pairing them up romantically? Does that do anything to the story or... Yeah, I mean, it, I mean it, it, it was subtly there in this, but it wasn't really, you know, a big yeah. part of it. So. Well, so the other thing about this comic is that they're, they, Mulder and Scully have a, a son, which we come out to find oh, out later right. that Eesh. Scully was actually pregnated by the smoking man's DNA. So technically it's his son, which is very weird. But basically Ugh. when uh, Joe Harris went to write this series, he talked to Chris Carter, who said the son is off limits. So that's kind of why he went oh, with Gibson okay. Praise was to have sort of the young prodigy type story to be able to kind of tell what he wanted to do without talking about William, who we do see in the, I think he's in the second movie and then in the, the uh, like oh, really? seasons 10, season 10 as well. Yeah. So there's, Oh, okay. There's more things that go on with that. But, but I think, I think to answer your question, like, after nine years of working together so intimately on these case files, it kind of <laughs> seems like a natural thing that would, you know, just sort of happen. And of course, with all the fans yeah. pushing for it, it's probably something that they're like, well, we'll give this to you eventually, but it's kind of fun to to keep it going. And I have a few yeah. kind of tidbits on that and their characters uh, in the after show. So make sure you check that out on YouTube oh, okay. after the episode. I've always kind of felt like it's, the cliche and obvious writing choice to pair them up together and sure. i don't particularly love it i don't necessarily hate it either but so scully dana scully is inspired by and they've said this in interviews before that her character was written to be like jody foster in silence of the lambs yeah so they had seen the movie and they're like wow this tough you know go get them female character that's going to go in there. She's not grossed out by the stuff that, that the men are grossed out by. Um, you can see a lot of that just basically lifted wholesale from that character in of Clarice in um, Silence of the Lambs and kind of paste it onto the Dana Scully character. And of course she becomes her own character and, you know, the nine seasons they develop her into something else. But I I feel like it weakens her a little bit to to have her like okay let's have them do the romance subplot and all that stuff and it's i'm not opposed to that being a part of the show but i almost wish that she wasn't dating like her partner i wish it was like somebody else or or something it would almost be more interesting if she was dating somebody that was like totally out of the loop that she had to keep all the fbi secrets from and like couldn't tell them what was going on in her job <laughs> or something than to have them be together just from like a dramatic standpoint you know mm-hmm. so I don't know. There was a run on uh, Green Lanterns right after, I think around 2016, whenever that that series began with Jessica uh, Cruz and Simon Boz, where for the longest time they were just partners. And then towards the end of it, they started to pair them up romantically. And I was like, do we have to do this just because they're partners? Like, it's fine for them to just be partners and not be romantically involved. Like, that doesn't have to happen. So. Hmm. They probably did it in an organic way on the show, and I know that the fans were calling for it, but I also actually found an interview with um, Rob Bowman, who was one of the directors that I think he directed more episodes of the show than anybody else, uh, where he was talking about, like, we really didn't want to do that because we thought it was kind of predictable and blah, 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 but then Mm -hmm. everybody was, like, pushing for it so hard that eventually we just gave in yeah, because we're like, well you know, you've got the network pressure on you and they're going, well, do you want the show to continue? And, you know, all of that going on too. So I don't know. I, I could kind of go either way with it. I think I would prefer them not to be romantically involved, but it's such a minor part of their story, at least in this comic, that it it really doesn't matter. I didn't even realize that they were still together, except that there's one panel when uh, Scully and and, uh, Mulder have been apart for a long time. 
where she like embraces him and kisses him on the lips and i was mm-hmm. like oh wow okay i guess they're <laughs> together like i i totally forgot about that so i think that comes from also just them being together for so long being partners at work sure. and you know spending nine years of work together in precarious life or death situations all the time and that's what i meant earlier <laughs> where i feel it's like kind of natural and it it would happen yeah. over time but i like that they didn't force it and that they kind of resisted against it for the longest time and then even when it did become something that they did it didn't take over the show because really right. the show I think works with the formula of them sort of being not at odds personally, but just being on mm-hmm. completely mm-hmm. different perspectives and investigating all of these, you know, crazy things that are going on and hearing from each of their perspectives. But I also like that the show kind of like basically says, well, you know, Scully, you're the science person, but, uh, all this stuff is true. Like in, in the show, right. they, always show it, they always show it to us. Like, this is absolutely true. There absolutely is a monster living in the sewer. And then mm-hmm. Mulder's like, well, you know, there could be a monster in the sewer. And Scully's like, no, that's just not possible. There's nothing that could survive. There's just nothing. Nope, nope, nope. And like, but we know, cause we just saw it, you know, we saw the guy in the makeup. So we know it's true. So it's kind of funny how it like kind of contradicts itself that way. Where Scully's it trying to prove it's not true, but we know it is. It does. It it is a lot of fun to hear their different perspectives, um, not just on the like the case that they're investigating, but it is interesting to have the believer character be the character that's an atheist and the skeptic character be the character that has faith. That's mm-hmm. an interesting aspect of them as well that I feel like they're whenever they get into those issues, which isn't usually real heavy, but whenever they do it's interesting that they are on those sides of the spectrum as well, because you would think based on how they treat the cases that it would be the other way around, you yeah. know? So well, that, it, I, I think that that was a smart, like wrinkle to give both of their characters. The So the first time that that happens, it's really weird because I almost felt like a switch was flipped because we, mm. I, I can't remember what episode it was, but it was like, I think it was season two where Basically, okay. you know, we're, we're going along doing our thing. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, something's going on. That's an issue of faith. And so suddenly Scully's the one that's like, hmm, that's interesting. You know, that that's really, I mean, it could yeah. be a sign that could happen. And Mulder's like, oh, this religion crap, whatever. Get out of here. No way. It could be. <laughs> it's probably something psychological like this. Like they totally just. Right. Balls. And it was, yeah. it was very drastic. I felt like in the episode where all of a sudden it's like, whoa, you know, what are we doing here? But mm-hmm. But I, I think the idea there was, like you said, to capture that, like they have this dynamic of, you know, the skeptic and the believer, but really it can change, you know, based on what it is that we're talking about. Because in areas of, right. of faith, like Scully starts going back to confession and she starts wearing her cross mm-hmm. more and, you know, stuff like that when she realizes that, you know, she's been out of the loop for a while, whereas Mulder's just like immediately dismissive. And it's like, well, Mulder, you're so open-minded when it comes to all these things about alien abduction right. and these weird <laughs> creatures. And people are like, oh, I just saw the weirdest thing. And you're like, okay, I'm going to, you know, take that with a grain of salt, but, you know, you could be right. But then as soon as they're like oh i saw you know the stigmata he's like nope fake done it's a hoax it's over you know what though is there not an actual episode where there is somebody suffering from like demonic possession Mm -hmm. and doesn't Mulder have to go in there and and doesn't he witness the demon being cast out or whatever i mean isn't that that so as far as the show is concerned what Scully believes in has validity to it as well. So that's interesting Mm -hmm. as well, because it's like they both have skepticism about things that are technically true as far as, you know, the the show shows us. Yeah. One more note about that episode. That's the first episode of the X-Files that I ever saw as a kid. And it scared the crap (laughs) out of me. Um, So one of the reasons I didn't watch it growing up is I was like, oh, that's the, the demon show where they Mm. have like people sweating and convulsing and being tied down to the bed and stuff. And maybe I was like 12 or something when I saw that. So I was like, that show is terrifying. I'm never watching that again. (laughs) And so then as an adult, I went back and I was like, oh my gosh, this is such a good show. But I didn't know that there was more to it than that because that was my introduction. So. And that there were more terrifying <laughs> episodes like the floof right. man swimming in the little tubes or the Ugh. guy that can like crawl through the air vents or, you know, all those things. Like, oh my gosh. It's definitely worse the episodes for man. like, 
<laughs> There's the carnival one where doesn't the guy like eat all the other people at the end of the episode or so something? So the, the one yeah, guy it's... has like a, a growth that was like his, his twin or whatever, and it like separates oh, yeah, from yeah, him yeah. and it's trying to bond with somebody else because it's like just it's tired of him. And but when it tries mm -hmm. to bond with somebody else, it makes like this gaping hole in them and, and kills them. But yeah, so what ends up happening is one of the carnival guys ends up eating it because they're they're like, well, he'll eat anything. And at the end of the episode, he's just like, <laughs> blah, blah, and they go, what's wrong with him? And the other guy's like, probably something he ate. And that's the end of the episode. Oh, <laughs> that's so gross. Yeah. That, that's kind of what you were talking about with the tone, though, is like the whole there are jokes in the show to break up the tension but mm -hmm. it is kind of like that dark humor where they're making light of yeah. something really disgusting or horrifying so <laughs> it's it's all in keeping with you know what's going on right but but that's the thing i think that's what makes it funny is because the characters are saying that because they don't know what we know and because right. we know it it's like dark humor but to them they're just like ah oh, it's probably something he ate like wh yeah. why, why is that so funny <laughs> well because <laughs> that's very true <laughs> well we've kind of i guess we've talked about most of the story really except for the, the resolution did you like that it ended on kind of a season cliffhanger note because it felt to me it was very this is the end of tv season we're going to take the summer off and we need to make sure that we hook you so you come back for the next season so it, yeah. it definitely had that that feel to it I think that's really good, though, because considering that the comic is actually called season 10 because it's the idea is yeah, to be a yeah. continuation. I think that's a, a good thing to do. Whereas if you were just like the X-Files, the additional case files or, you know, call it something else that's yeah. an ongoing series, that would have been weird. But to end a season, even though it's a comic with a cliffhanger like mm -hmm. that, yeah, I, I think is definitely cool. I've just kind of wondering if i go to season 11 volume one is it going to pick up eventually and we're going to see some more of this and it's going to be a really neat payoff yeah. or are they going to do what you know some other writers have done where they just completely dump the story until later and then barely revisit it so. uh, <laughs> yeah the echoes in particular is a series that i feel like picks up and drops story threads a lot mm -hmm. and I, I i don't know if that i mean you've seen more of it than me you can tell me if that's accurate but it, it seems like there are a lot of things that they did, like the, the actual season 10 on TV, they tried to argue in the first episode of that, that everything you saw was not actually aliens. It was just the government, uh, you know, you know, doing stuff that seemed like aliens to throw mm -hmm. you off their their case. And that was a little hard to believe when we've like literally seen spaceships land. They showed us like what 35,000 BC in the movie where there were aliens contacting earth and there were like eggs down there and it was yeah. infecting this person like at the beginning of humanity and all this stuff and I'm like no I'm pretty sure that was actually aliens <laughs> like it wasn't it wasn't uh so so it feels like retcons are, are one of those things that already happen as part of the show I would hope that they just continue with this writer and that it's resolve all this because I was definitely left going oh cool so Gibson made a bunch of clones of himself, um, yeah. a whole praise team, if you will, <laughs> of Gibsons. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, now what are we going to do with him? He's got all these clones that presumably all have his mental abilities. So that's super dangerous. And then, you mm -hmm. know, the story's just kind of like, it's over. So, yeah, it, it reminded me so much, honestly, of 90s TV. I mean, that's <laughs> how they would end seasons of shows in the 90s. Yeah, so. at least they avoided that crazy 90s slang like splainy and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, man. Well, fortunately, I feel like even though the X-Files has, you know, flatworm people and, uh, you know, werewolves and, and all kinds of other things, uh, it still feels more grounded in reality somehow than Buffy the Vampire Slayer does. <laughs> so, Very that's true. maybe a debatable statement. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> which version of reality would you rather have would you have the monsters that are there clearly doing things well even then i wouldn't say it's a conspiracy but there are people who don't believe that stuff exists until you see them right. getting ripped to shreds or getting the skin torn off their mm -hmm. bodies so that they're just left with just their muscle and you know things like that but listen to our <laughs> buffy episode if you haven't it's a it's a, a fun time <laughs> yes 
whole lot of flaying going on. Yep. Um, All right. Well, well, are you ready to move to the final thoughts? Let's do it. Comics, comics, comics. I I don't know who went first last time. I'm ready. If go if for it, not, though. Um. So I'm actually going to give it a four. I think that it did everything perfectly well. It felt like the regular continuation of the series. Honestly, in some ways, more than the actual season ten did, because my memory of that TV season was like halfway through they dumped Mulder and Scully for these like younger versions of them <laughs> where the roles were reversed. And it was like Robbie Amell and, uh, you know, Stephen oh, Amell's yeah. younger brother and like, like some young girl. And like, she was the believer and he was the skeptic. And then they were working for the FBI. And I wasn't so much a fan of that. I was like, no, give us more Mulder and Scully. That's why we're here. So mm-hmm. the comic book kind of delivered on what I was wanting the TV show to do at that point instead and for that reason, I think I would give it a four. I mean, it, it has a few rough edges. Like, there, there are a few times in the art where maybe it's not exactly clear what's going on. And um, maybe it's a little bit slowly paced at times. But that's kind of just the nature of this property. When you're adapting it for a visual media where you're not watching acting, sometimes you are just going to have static shots in a comic book of people talking to each other. And that's not as dynamic as like a superhero series or something that's very action focused, but I feel like they pulled it off where it was entertaining enough, even though it's not the most like visually stunning thing out there. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a four out of five. Uh, If you like the X-Files, I think it's definitely worth reading. And, you know, I I would honestly love to read the four volumes preceding this to get caught up on all of it. because I think it was really good. All right. Four out of five bananas for you. And for me, I think I will go with a three and a half bananas out of five. Oh, so I I agree with what you said. Like I I, and we kind of said, too, that, you know, it's a continuation of the series. And so if you watch the Mm -hmm. series and then you go into this, I feel like it's a good like it feels like a continuation. It doesn't feel like we're necessarily going in a completely new direction. We haven't like changed a whole lot of people. We're just kind of continuing on where things left off. So I, I thought that was really good, but I also felt like we're we're maybe missing some opportunities to really modernize, you know, the way that, mm. that the X-Files in is. And that might be a more impossible task than it seems because I kind of wondered as I was reading this is, d- does the X-Files work because it's grounded in the 90s where sort of the the formula was perfect for conspiracy theories and keeping things secret and shadow organizations and they they had their cell phones to use for communication but it wasn't like it is now where you're you know constantly no. you know and then you've got the information at your fingertips so i kind of felt like i was looking at the x files sort of like in a modern retelling but not necessarily Mm. a modern like based currently in modern times like with darkwing duck we kind of got okay they've got cell phones it feels a little bit more modern because of that but nothing really as far as that goes would affect darkwing duck because okay they can get information faster so what goslin's going to be like the school's on fire text message and darkwing's going to be like okay and he's going (laughs) to rush over there so that doesn't really hurt the story but with the Mm x-files i feel like the whole magic of what makes it great kind of starts to fall apart if you bring it into where it currently is and you try to keep the same formula that worked in the 90s. It's kind of like Back to the Future yeah. and why there will never be a Back to the Future 4 or further based on what the creators have said mm-hmm. because the way that what made it so good was because of everything that kind of came together in the time period of when it came out. Because the other thing too is, and we'll get yeah. to this in the after show, of all the influences of the X-Files and how you know Chris Carter developed the show and how it came to be, a lot of the references and what stuff is based on it seems really groundbreaking but a lot of it's just based on old shows that he used to watch in like the 70s so it's kind of but i've never heard of any of those shows so you know it's kind of like we we start to sort of lose the things that made it cool because it doesn't seem so out of place nowadays like okay we have a female Mm. who's a medical doctor and who's very skeptical and scientific well we've seen that for years and years and years so now in you know 2024 if we're going to have that character again it's just another one you know it's not necessarily something sure 
And I feel like a lot, the weakness with a lot of reboots these days is that they try to make younger versions of the characters, but then, like you said, they, they mix them up like, oh, well, let's make him the skeptic. And, you know, it's just, yeah, it just doesn't work. So yeah. I, I feel like this story, it worked. It was fun. It was a, a continuation of the series. Mm -hmm. So I definitely want to give it some points because I didn't hate it. I enjoyed it. But yeah. at the same time, for me, it's not quite at that four level because I feel like there's still so much work to do to really bring X-Files into current, the current yeah. world, if you will. And that's... Well, now where, when did this come out? Was it like around 2010, 2011, somewhere in... Oh, it's 2013. So it was later than I thought then. I was I was placing it much closer to like um, 9-11 era politics mm. based on how they were acting, based on the locations they were mentioning, things like that. It felt like early 2000s to me, which was interesting. So yeah. um, had I thought about it in more of a 2013 lens, I might have reacted similarly. That's interesting. Um, I I think it's possible to modernize this, but I also think that the 90s, if you remember what TV was like, the TV landscape was like at the time, uh, I mean, your mom, not, not I'm not making a joke, hey. your mom, uh, your mom watched a lot of like, oh, true UFO sighting shows and like conspiracy mm. shows. And I know there would be stuff like on all the time it seemed like in the 90s, like, like it was really big because you couldn't just go out and find that information. It was, you were either getting it from a TV show or, you know, maybe at a bookstore or something like that. But now you can look on the internet and I can yeah. find every appearance that the Mothman has had this year <laughs> in the country, you know, or, or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, you know, and, and information is just so much more accessible. So that's interesting to be like, the formula was great, but maybe the formula doesn't work in the modern era. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder what we could do to fix that. Actually, you, yeah. Tell us in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. Just that, make sure that, that would you be great. Don't don't let Disney catch win because they own Fox, which owns the X-Files. Oh. So, you know, they might take your idea and make it into something. <laughs> so maybe uh, oh my gosh. Private message us on Instagram. Not only does Disney own Fox, but they own Fox Mulder. Fox Mulder, yep. Well, that's a good place to uh, wrap up our review of the X-Files Season 10, the comic, not the uh, TV series. We hope you enjoyed this episode of We Like Comics because they have no bones. Make sure you rate us on your podcast platform of choice and also comment, like, and subscribe on YouTube and be sure to check out our after shows where the discussion continues. That's right. And tell us what you think of this comic by posting on social media at Boneless Comics Podcast or on X at Boneless Comics One using the hashtag Boneless Comics Podcast for all of your questions and comments. And next episode, we will be discussing Star Trek Deep Space Nine The Dog of War, written by Mike Chin with art by Angel Hernandez, published in 2023, also by IDW. All right. That sounds like a fun time. Well, this is Special Agent Joe Getcho. I'm getting out of here. I've got some uh, reports to fill out. So uh, thanks and see you next time. All right. Peace out. We want to believe. Comics, comics, comics. Big, 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 big.